Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. This is Bree Noble. I'm excited to be here with Daryl Hers. He works with CD Baby and Indie Week and I think uh, just a ton of other places, as far as I can tell from his bio, he really consults with a lot of other companies. So I'm really interested to talk with him and find out all of his experience in the music industry over the past like 25 plus years. But before we get into that, Daryl, you want to give them a little background on how you got into the music industry and a little bit about your journey so far. Sure. Uh, first, thank you for having me here, Bree. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so it's been a long haul. I started uh, way back as a guitarist in a band and went through all the progressions of being the one that does the business in the band, booking, promotions, all of that, uh, which led to booking uh, venues in Toronto, which led to managing artists. Uh, and then during that time, I started Indie Week uh, just out of a frustration for allowing emerging artists a stage to be discovered. So that's how Indie Week came about, probably about 20 years ago now. It's crazy. COVID's made me lose track. <laughs> uh, and then during that time, I've been with uh, CD Baby for almost three years now uh, doing uh, market development in Canada. But uh, there's a whole, you could almost say almost all the hats from management, tour manager, promoter, booker, even uh, I, I do a side hustle of graphic design and web design. And oh. uh, I worked with Live Nation for about eight years. And during which I rebranded the company and also did the first version of VIPNation.com for them as well. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of experience. Um, I'm curious about Indie Week because I know now it's a pretty big thing, right? How did that kind of evolve from just you starting it 20 years ago to where it is now? It's It's been quite the long haul, I got to say. We've gone through everything you could think of. It's like an indie band. You know, the it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. <laughs> indie Week was originally just a hobby. It was just meant to be a place for indie bands to play. And then international artists started coming. Uh, and then through that, I started managing an artist in Ireland. So we actually did Indie Week in Ireland for six years. And we moved it to UK and we did that. I think it was four years and then Brexit came about and we were like, uh, we're going to not touch that for a while. So, <laughs> so we focus on Canada. Uh, but yeah, it just started as a hobby and it just kept growing organically. And, and now it's it's a full time thing. And, and we do import and export. We do mentorships. We're building a community online. We, we're launching a podcast soon. And during COVID, we moved it so that it's online as the conference side of things because we can't really do the festival element. And we've launched three other conferences as well online. So we're doing four conferences a year, mentorships. Uh, we also launched Indie Weekly, which is every Tuesday. And we do a free session talking industry every uh, four o'clock every Tuesday, Toronto time. And uh, so we're busier than ever before, actually. It's it's actually. It's really crazy, but we're busier than ever before. Yeah, you guys are doing a lot. I, I had first heard about Indie 101 like last year and I was like, what is this? Like, where did it come from? Because I think I you know, had some friends that were speaking at it or something. What made you decide? I mean, was it basically COVID that made you decide to like add all these other virtual conferences? Yeah, absolutely. So Indie 101 was actually the name of our conference during Indie Week when we were in person. Oh, okay. And so when we, we when we did Indie Week last year online, we figured Indie Week is the stronger brand. So our conference online was Indie Week. And when we're doing it online, we can't really do what we normally do in person. We take over a hotel and there's many rooms happening at the same time. And 
really you just can't dilute your audience that way online. So we've actually, it's almost like we've taken our conference and split it into different tracks or demographics. So screen by screen is our February conference and that's music and tech. So we focus on AI, VR, blockchain. This time it's going to be metaverse as well. Uh, Indie 101 is May coming up and that's going to be, well, basically it's 101. So it's a lot of how to and presentations and things like that. And then Music Pro Summit was in September and will be again. And that's high level industry discussion. So higher talks about data, like we had Deezer, Spotify, Facebook, uh, all as participants. And then Indie Week is now our hub where we bring it all together and we focus on community and diversity while incorporating all of those, but uh, really focused on international connections. And, and so uh, that's how we put it all together. And it's been working out actually really well for us. And Indie Week that just happened was the highest attended of our online conferences. And mm. so it's, it's gaining momentum uh, right now, which is really cool. That's awesome. So do you expect, you know, if all goes well in 2022, do you expect to bring Indie Week back in person? No, we're, really? we're going to do the conferencing online. Uh, we have plans to re- launch a different in-person festival if it's safe and everything. But uh, the conferencing, we've been having so much positive feedback. We're getting so many results. Artists are meeting others and collaborating. There's been songs that have been written, produced. Uh, shows have been booked. So, so we see this as a very positive thing at being online and we're still getting results. That's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I'll be really curious to see, you know, CD Baby and the other conferences, ASCAP Expo and, you know, Taxi Road Rally and things that I've been involved in, if they do come back in person or not. Um, I would think that they are going to. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and so we look at it as we're augmenting what will happen in person. And, and so there's connections being made with artists before they go to a country. Uh, Cause a lot of times in the past, you would get a showcase say in Spain and you've never been there before. So you go there, spend all the money to perform. And when you're there, that's when you're trying to make connections. So we're trying to be the precursor, make connections now so that when you get there, it's actually a better experience. So this could kind of augment a conference that they are going to, if they're going to like CD Baby Barcelona, or, you know, the things that that are maybe going to come back in the future. Exactly. And we've we've partnered with many international conferences and festivals. So for instance, yesterday we were online with Sim Sao Paulo. The week before was VMF Peru and Luke Fest Taiwan. Uh, there's just this numerous conferences that we're participating in online for that exact purpose. And, and the goal is really a lot to get artists booked uh, to go there. So, or collaborate, make songs and, and such. That's really cool. I love, I love that synergy that you're creating. Um, so for people that are listening that might be interested in these online conferences, I know that Indie Week already happened. But um, probably the next one coming up that I know our listeners would be super interested in is the Indie 101. How would they get involved with that? And and what's the cost for them to do that? Uh, Basically, everything is online at IndieWeek.com, I-N-D-I-E-W-E-E-K. We literally just announced Super Early Bird tickets and passes. Uh, Our next conference is February Screen by Screen, and that's the music and tech one. Uh, And one thing that we've introduced now is there's a pass that it's a one fee and you get to go to all of them. Oh my goodness. Wow. And yeah, so it's, and we try to keep it really cheap Uh, and I'll be, I'm guilty. I don't know the price off the top of my head. I should, Uh, but I think it's like 60 bucks for a pass right now or something. I don't quote me, but, but it's pretty cheap. So indieweek.com is where you could go. That's really cool. Okay. You guys go check that out for sure. I, one of my students was saying they went to Indie Week and they absolutely loved it. So, um, highly recommend it. So let's talk about distributors. Cause I know you work with CD baby. You've been involved with them for a while and I gotta say, so I teach a course called rock your next release and, you know, students are, are basically going through the release process. And I don't know why, but distrib- distributors is like the biggest stumbling block for them. It just seems like they can't decide which one to choose. You know, it's, they're just like analysis paralysis or something. 
I always recommend CD Baby because I have my own reasons that I like them better, mainly because I want to pay one fee one time. But I'm curious, you know, what kind of questions do you guys get around distributors and what do you feel like the artist, you know, are keeping the artists kind of confused about distributors? Well, I think in general, tech keeps moving and changing, which keeps us all confused. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, like how do you monetize TikTok? And TikTok didn't, wasn't even a thing really three years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's always new things that I think, you know, artists and creators have always had this sort of like, you know, are they being underpaid? And there's a concern there. So they're always gonna be additional concerns for signing up to anything really. And, and I, I agree, uh, one of our biggest uh, selling points is the one-time fee. When you're uploading multiple tracks and releases, it gets costly over time. But then when you have to renew yeah. every year, and it's, it's unforgiving. If you miss that payment, it's taken down everywhere. And then that means you're going to have to pay again to get it up. And, and it's I, I, th I look at it like this, a lot of DIY and emerging artists are running their business themselves. And what really helps them is the less things they have to worry about that's gonna be a distraction from actually creating music, the better it is for them. And there's gonna be different levels as artists progress through their career. But if they don't have the time to make sure they're signing up to all the PROs and the places to collect royalties properly and then also be on top of oh here's a new place to create uh collect royalties that i need to check a box on a dashboard and things like that and and that's really a big strong point of cd baby pro is it allows an artist to be confident that the royalties are being collected and distributed and as new things open up it's going to also be collected and distributed so there's there's less work for the artist if that makes any sense you know you let them focus on creating the music and we collect the money and the big bonus and we got a lot of positive feedback through covid is that if money comes in it's actually paid the very next week mm. so there's no waiting six months there's no those thresholds so that's been really helpful for a lot of artists knowing that you know that if anything comes in they're getting a check right away and, and that's been big uh, during COVID. Okay, well, I'm going to open up this can of worms because I get a lot of questions about this um, with the CD Baby Pro. What if they do sign up for that? They are giving away their publishing, correct? Uh, no, not giving away their publishing. We're collecting. It, it may see, seem like like it looks like as if CD Baby is the collector, but it's just a label so that we're we're collecting on their behalf and then we pay them. Okay, but are the what if they want to go do something with that song? Say they want to sign it with, you know, a, a company wants to license it for something. Would they be able to have that control to be able to do that, or would they have to get CD Baby on board? No, absolutely. Their their song is their song. It's, it's okay. We own we own zero percent. It's a hundred percent on the artists, and they can okay. do whatever they want with it. Uh, we want them to make money, uh, so. Yeah, there's no like exclusivity on trying to sync or get it placed in TV or film or anything like that. Got it. So are you more of a publishing administrator then? That's it. Exactly. So in alliance with something like Song Trust. In fact, Song Trust is ours. So got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the Song Trust is our backbone for royalty collection. Got it. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Now, do you have a service that does help artists try to get, you know, sync placements and things like that that they can also opt into or is that kind of the same service uh basically yeah they just opt in and then okay. there, we have a search engine that music supervisors use so that means they're included in that uh and we do have a sync and license team that does service requests that do come in for from music supervisors as well got it um yeah i just i think there's a lot like a lot of that is a little bit murky for artists for whatever reason. And part of it is just the way the music industry is set up, right? Yeah. There's, just, there's so many places that you can get royalties from and so many ways that you can get them and so many ways that you cannot get them. Yeah. And the fear is missing out. Like uh, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're not collecting royalties properly, it's hard to go back and find them and, and yep. get them. So, uh, which is why it's really important set up properly and, and, 
you know, I, I'm really big on putting out the message that make sure your metadata is in order. I, I recommend to every artist, create a spreadsheet. And when you're filling out a form but, and uploading music, create a field in the spreadsheet that matches every field on the online form so that you actually have an offline record of your data. And if you need to place it somewhere else, you're using the exact same data. So uh, I tell that to artists all the time. That's, yeah, that's a really good tip. I like that. Um, so what are some of the other tools that CD Baby has that you recommend the artists look into to, to amplify what they're doing with what they're distributing? Absolutely. Uh, show.co is, uh, allows yep. you to do advertising. And uh, in fact, our next uh, session next Tuesday is going to be walking through how to set up an ad campaign using show.co with, an, with a CD Baby artist that has had success in increasing their revenue by using ads. So show.co is a really great platform in placing your ads on websites that target the, the correct demographics. So think of like people who like music would go to billboard.com or rollingstone.com. Uh, so, so it places your ads onto those types of websites and you don't have to spend a lot. It could be like $50 a week. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a huge budget, but the one thing I do know is when artists are not advertising, they're really giving a disservice to their craft because organic is really tough these days. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's really hard. And I know I've done an ad campaign with Indie Week and it cost me just under $400, but we reached 1.2 million people. Wow. So it's worth it. Yeah. Now, do you also, do you still recommend doing like pre-saves, like Spotify pre-saves? Is that still a useful tool? Yes, absolutely. You know, it, it's almost like you have to think of your audience and out of 10 people, there's probably 10 personalities that are different. <laughs> so you, you, it's, it's kind of like, I, I, like with distribution, I, I sort of use these sort of metaphors. If I'm in Greece and I go to a Greek island and I can go to any store and find Coca-Cola, that means the distributor did the job getting it to be found wherever people are looking. And so when you're trying to get discovered and get more people, you want to be in the places where people are and people are going to be in so many different places. Uh, so that's why if you think of like a in-person type ad campaign, you'll see billboards, you'll see posters, you'll see something on the subway, uh, something at the bus shelter. And it, it's, it's the impressions is what you're really trying to build up so that people start recognizing the brand, recognizing the name. And eventually it turns into clicks and, and, and also trust. Cause you're, you're really trying to build through online presence. You're building a trust because you want them to listen to your music and engage with it. So, so the more places you can be found or seen, the better it is. And so well, like following that logic, do you also recommend that you do, you know, pre-saves or promoting of your track on all the different streaming platforms because maybe your audience likes you know is is automatically listening to music on different ones versus just focusing all on say spotify it, it, i think it, it depends on the artist you have to kind of know what platform is going to be your best platform to promote on often artists have a limited budget and limited time so you kind of want to select where you're going to get the maximum first out of the efforts and money you put into it and then grow out from there. And I would kind of go, I, it's almost like this one is going to get the best results. Let's build that up and get to know what works and what doesn't, and then take that knowledge and then start building onto the second platform and see what works and what doesn't then build onto a third. And that gives you a little bit more calculated efforts as you grow and you'll probably produce higher level results as opposed to doing everything everywhere and then finding out what went wrong mm -hmm. here or there. And, and you've already spent time and money and often artists do that. And then they say, I'll never do that again. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so I think hone the craft a little bit on what marketing is and, and keep building it out. Um, I have to say that we do have a release planner tool on our website. Uh, so if you go to cdbaby.com, you can search around and find like, we've got this 
release planner where you put in your date and it'll create a, a basic timeline of points of things you should be doing to lead up to your release. Yeah, that's really cool. And I'm big on timeline, <laughs> big time. Like my entire program is built around, like you've got to have a timeline and you've got to fit everything into it because there's so many moving parts in a release, especially when you're looking at things like planning a tour around it and stuff like that. You can't just like decide to do a tour after the release happens because it's going to take you so long to like get the venues and all of that, right? So I love the idea of the timeline and integrating as much as possible into it, especially, you know, if you want to get some PR and things like that, you've got to get your research done and figure out who you can, who you want to talk to and, and stuff like that. But I know your planner also like will help you know, like when should you start doing your marketing and stuff like that? Yeah. Timelines are huge. I tell artists that if they can, I know it can be tough, but if you can get there, you should have a 12 to 24 month timeline. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> I say that and people like their eyes get really big and they like shut off and they're like, I no, I want to release it next week. And like, no, you know, I, you I'm really dealing with an artist it. right now that I'm like, they're like, oh, it didn't. Good. I'm like, when did you put it up? And it's like five days ago. It's got to be time, you know, so it's really tough. Mm, I'm so glad you said that because seriously, like, I get a lot of pushback on the 12 month thing. And, and this is for an EP or an album, right? You, you can release singles throughout that time period. And so it's not like you're just waiting this whole 12 months to release it, but it's hard to have that kind of patience as an artist, I think. Yeah, and I've prior to all this, when I was managing and consulting artists, there's times where they had their album ready in April. And I, I said, October is the best time for them to release it. You know, it's the kind of thing that you have to look at what is going to be happening around your release date that could yep. influence what's going to happen, holidays, other events, like is the Grammy Awards happening the night of your release? Probably mm -hmm. not too many people are going to be looking for your song. You know, like what's your competition? And, and you've got to pick your moments. And there's outside influences here in Canada, for instance, funding, we get a lot of grants or artists have access to grants, there's deadlines. And so you need to have certain stats to submit. And that means that uh, sometimes it forces that, oh, you can't submit a grant for a release that's already out or out by this time. So, so that's going to influence it. Mm. Uh, and then I, I really do say conferences is a way to access a large group of industry professionals. And so are you promoting a release at a certain conference or not? And, and so like there's, there's certain things to think about that are going to influence it. Timelines is, is big and I'm really big on spreadsheets. So I'm going to say, put it into a spreadsheet. And then what's really easy is at the end of the year, you've got the tab and you go make a copy and you kind of have a template for the timeline for next year. And, and then you see what worked, what didn't, and you adjust, but now you're only adjusting things, not making it again from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. It's a re total repeatable process and it's not like you're going to stop releasing music. So why not create this system for yourself, right? It makes it so like people are asking us, how are you doing four online conferences and how are you doing everything? Uh, uh, we build a template and, and it's repeatable, which means we're actually probably doing as, as we do it, we get better because we're repeating something we've done and we're probably spending 25% less effort on it each time because we're getting better at it and we're not reinventing it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's build a plan, have a timeline, but have a record of it. So then you could say what's working, what's not. Uh, when I managed artists or artists would come to me, I would say, and this is kind of like what told me, do they have a plan or are they keeping records? I'd be like, so what's, is your profit up by 10% this year? And by putting a number on it and stuff, they'd be like, uh, I don't know. I'm like, well, if you had a spreadsheet, you would know. And, and that's the first step. Right. And, and, it's the kind of thing, if you've got your timeline, you're like, we went to that conference or festival and it didn't really work for us. You take it out, but then you find which next one you're going to go to instead. And, and so, yeah, timelines. I, I, I'm with you on it. And I, I applaud you as well for uh, uh, pushing timelines out. 
Yeah. Timelines, systems, and data. That's what I just got out of all of that, that we just talked about. Cause it's, and it's all the things that artists don't really love. I mean, there's an occasional artist that loves that stuff. Like I'm one of those, but you know, most of them, they don't love that stuff. And so I've been trying to, you know, spoon feed it to them as much as they're willing to take it from me because it really does. It really does make a big difference. It, it makes a huge difference. And, you know, my, I started as a guitar player and I didn't want to do spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do this stuff, but it has made such an impact on business and knowing where I am. Am I doing better than last year? And, and if not, can we adjust so that we can get to better than last year? Like allows you to keep a, a sort of like a sense of the pulse on where you are at within the year. And do you need to push more or ease up? It, it really does expose the weaknesses. And when you can get rid of those, uh, then you're stronger. That's right. I love it. Well, is there anything else we haven't covered today that you wanted to say to our listeners? Just, you know what? I, I really believe this is the best time to be a creator. I wish I had the tools when I was playing in bands. I, I say, say the story that when I played in bands, you had to rent a studio and it was up to $100 plus an hour. And then you'd have to master the songs and that was up to about $1,000 per track. So it 10 song CD was immediately 10,000 just in mastering. Then you had to get artwork. Then you had to get printed and copies. We were 25, 35 grand in the hole when we got that CD in our hand. And radio stations wouldn't play indie. A lot of the record stores wouldn't carry indie. You had to go out and flog it playing shows. And that was really the only way. So now having access to getting onto playlists and getting streaming means you have an international audience uh, being able to produce yourself and release as a DIY artist it is the best time and there's so many more places to collect royalties from as well so I say be excited to be a creator be excited to be an artist and get your music out there and make sure you're promoting it properly yeah. And there's so many tools for artists. I just interviewed um, Jamie from Pandora. And I mean, the things that they've created to make artists' lives easier and to be able to connect with their fans are incredible. It, it's, it's amazing. It literally is amazing. You know, it's the kind of thing that if artists really look at fans and people and value them, like you can talk to, you can reach out on Facebook and send a direct message. You can send a direct message on Instagram or Twitter. You can really build your audience right now. But uh, the, the message I've been really saying the last few months is take care of your audience. Uh, mm. You know, it's the kind of thing I'm working on this other spreadsheet, this potential profit people calculator. I've got this crazy name. But imagine if one fan was worth $100 in a year. They bought a CD, they bought a shirt, two tickets, say it equals up to $100. Would you not be willing to spend 15 minutes talking to them, right? And a lot of times it's like, here's my show, come to my show. Here's my song, come play it. And, but it's not back and forth. So I really am pushing, you know what, especially during this time, people want to be talked to as people, take care of them. And, and man, that fan could turn into a super fan. And imagine the value of, of a super fan in 10 years. Right. And now if you could get a thousand of those, what's the value of it? So really take care of people and be nice, be kind and take care of your fans. Plus, I, I think we forget like how amazing it is to have someone tell you, like, I'm a fan, like, I love your music. I'm a super fan. You know, I had someone say that to me the other day about my podcast because my other podcast, it's been running for six and a half years. And she's like, I've you know, done on this, this, and this because of you. And I'm like, holy crap, that's amazing. Right. And I think artists sometimes just think of fans as like another thing to deal with instead of realizing that they're going to like feed their, their soul, their ego, their creativity by talking to their fans. Yeah. Well, you know, I did a session, uh, a talk with Steve Stewart who managed Stone Temple Pilots. And he was talking about <laughs> what they did on their first release is they actually put a mailing address on it. Mm. 
And what ended up happening is all like all this mail just kept coming in of people mailing them. So he said one day he sat the band down, dumped out all the letters and it's like hundreds, if not thousands of them and said, you're going to call all of them. And, and they're like, what? And like, yeah, imagine this person wrote to you from Colombia or this person wrote to you from Spain. Imagine if they get a phone call, how dedicated they're going to be. And then they're going to go and tell everybody, hey, Scott Weiland just called me. <laughs> like, how crazy is that? And, and it worked immensely well for the band, obviously. And that was like off their first release. So, you know, if you really put in the time with the people, and, and I, I kind of do this bluntly with artists sometimes. How do I get more streams? More people. How do I make more money? Sell more tickets to more people and shirts to people. And so, so people is the common denominator to success, right? Yeah. And, and as we were talking about data, you know, I think we can get a, either we don't, we ignore the data or we get lost in the data and just see it as numbers and forget that there's people behind those numbers. That's right. And, and as well, the data can start showing what's fake, what's real, because mm. there's a lot of fake stuff out there too. Uh, but that's the bottom line is, is people like people are like, how do I get more money? People, how do I get a sponsor? Show them you have people that <laughs> will, you know, like that's really it. And, and I've, when I've worked with artists, I said to them, you know what, don't focus on the money first, focus on the people first. Because the money will come if you have people. And for sure, money won't come if you don't have people. So, so we focus on people first and it's worked absolutely every single time. Yep. I see each person in your fan base as an asset that, you know, potential future earnings, but also, you know, potential support and sharing of what you have with more people. That's it. And I got to be honest, a lot of times, like I'll, I'll go on Instagram and I just voice message people that are interacting randomly. And uh, there's times where they've come back and said, oh, I've got a connection. I've been meaning to send your way. Mm -hmm. And so new business has come out of just reaching out to people randomly. And they introduced me to somebody that now is like a sponsor or a partner. Uh, so all I know is when you do nothing, nothing happens, do stuff and stuff happens. And I, <laughs> I just stole that from Martin Atkins. <laughs> Love it. Well, that is a great way to end this episode. Thank you so much. And remind everybody again, how can they um, get involved with Indie Week? What's that website address? Yeah, just go to IndieWeek.com, I-N-D-I-E-W-E-E-K. And uh, we're really active on Instagram. So we're really easy to find there as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. This has been really great. And I loved geeking out all over the timeline and the data and the spreadsheets and all that stuff. And I hope the artists that are listening really take that to heart when it comes to the releasing their music. I, I agree. I, I enjoy geeking out. And uh, so I appreciate your approach and what you your message is as well. So thank you, Brie. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.